Okay. Tonight, uh, I'd just like to share a couple of thoughts about uh, some, some gentlemen that I found in the scriptures. And uh, because as, as I read scripture, I find that there are, there are some, some people wrote some final conclusions. They come to their end of their, their time, you know, and they, they write some final conclusions down and it's their personal thoughts. It's, it's recorded in scripture. And like Paul in 1 Timothy 4, 7, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. The thing is, see, I have finished my course. See, I've completed that which God wanted me to do. And when you read through his life and you see all he went through and, and all the difficulties he's had, and it sits there, I finish my course. What greater satisfaction could one have than to be able to say that about your life? You look back over your life and you say, you know, I, 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 just, I just did everything that I was supposed to do. I, I was able to complete that which I was going to do. And, and, but then there's another guy, another man in Scripture, that uh, presents me with a goal that I only hope that I can meet. And his name is Samuel. In 1 Samuel 12, 3, he says this, Behold, here am I. Witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? And of whose hands have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it to you. That's quite a lifestyle to have lived, to look back and be able to ask uh, those questions. But as I think about it, and, and you know, we read scripture and we listen and we try to do the best I can, it seems like to live with those same desires, to live with those same desires should be the desire, should be the intent of every Christian, should be the intent of any, every one of us. To be able to, to look back and, and, and say, you know, I didn't cheat anybody, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, 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 see that, but, but, you know what but is? But is the goat of life that pushes us into unexpected circumstances. Mm. Things we didn't plan on. Things we didn't count on. And all of a sudden, it's got us. It's hit us. And we find ourselves there. Now, one of the great men I find in the Bible is Abraham. He showed great faith. And that's what he's known. He's known as an, a, a man of faith. Because God gave him a word when he was way over here in the land of Ur. Then he traveled with his father over to this land and lived with him till the time came. And then when his father had passed away, he said, okay, let us go now into the land of Canaan. Now, I, th I think of that and I wonder how I do if I was 75 years old and 30 years ago, God kind of impressed this on my mind and had never spoken to me since through all the issues of life and everything that I had gone through, never said again, would I keep that word alive? See, that's, that's a pretty good question. 75-year-old man picks up everything that he has and he moves into a country that he doesn't know anything about. God hadn't told him what was going to happen yet. He just told him to go there. And he remembered what God said. He kept it in his mind. And when the time was right, he went and did it. And that's why Abraham is known as a man of faith. He kept his faith. See, he kept that word as faith. And this is what it says. God told him to stay in the land. In Genesis 12, verse 10, it says this. 
and there was a famine in the land. And when he was come near, and Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass when he was near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, This is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. I pray thee, thou art my sister. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass when Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, and she was very fair. The prince is also a Pharaoh saw and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called Abraham and says, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou now tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister, so that I may take her to wife? Now therefore behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. See, when God called Abraham into the land and told him to live there, he didn't tell him about the famine. I mean, yeah, the famine. He didn't tell him about that. He just told him to stay in the land, right? But what would we do? We can't feed our family, you know, things that are tight. We can't over here they're doing well. Would we not go over there and provide for our family? See, Abraham's pretty normal. Just told him to stay in the land. So he comes back into the land. And life goes on. In Genesis 20, it says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and Sodor and Gar. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, Thou art a dead man for a woman which thou hast taken, for she's a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she even herself said, he's my brother, and the integrity of my heart and innocency of my, innocency of my hands, I have done this. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou did this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffer I thee not to touch her. Now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he's a prophet, and he shall pray for thee. Thou shalt live. If thou restore her not, then know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done to us? And what have I offended thee? That thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin. Thou hast done deeds unto me that thou ought not to have done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet... She is my sister. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is the kindness that thou shalt show unto me at every place where, whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep auction, manservants, women servants, gave them to Abraham and restored Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleases thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of their eyes unto all that are with thee and all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and he healed Abimelech and his wife and manservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech, because he had Sarah, Abraham's wife. 
Abraham did the same thing again. He did the same thing again. He's supposed to stay in the land, right? He did the same thing again. Later, we read this in Genesis 24. And when Abraham was old and well stricken in age, the Lord blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of the house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country, to my kindred, to take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou that thou bring not my son thither. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me and swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And he sent an angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this oath. Only bring not my son thither again. Wow. You see the change? Here he's presented with things and he goes off into another country and gets himself into, works his mind, you know, and works this thing that this is going to be bust for me. And it turns out not to be very good. So through the result of the bad choices that he made, you see, truth was installed into his life. Sometimes it takes a, a little more to get, uh, get to us, right? A little more before we really understand what's going on. So we can't condemn Abraham and make fun of him because God is showing us what we would be like if we were in those maybe the same circumstances that we don't have the same thing, but sometimes, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I look back over my life and I see I've made some bad choices. Made some bad choices. But it wasn't the end. So it seems like at the end, everything turns out right. Now, you remember, I, I, told, I told you, I mentioned this a few times, and this is really big on my mind is that what we do speak so loud that they cannot hear what we say, right? What we do speak so loud they cannot hear what we say. So time goes on and Isaac's son comes into his own being and family. Genesis 26, verse 1. Genesis 26, verse 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the day of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gear. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt and dwell in the land which I should tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee, for unto thee, unto the seed, I give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I have sware unto Abraham his father. So God gave Isaac the same word that he gave to Abraham. This is your land. I want you to stay here. Stay here. And I will make thy seed multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And Isaac went and dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, She's my sister. For he feared to say she's my wife, lest he and the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech of the Philistines looked out the window and saw, and behold, Isaac 
was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and he said, Behold, of a surety she's your wife. And how saidest thou she's my sister? And Isaac said unto her, Because lest I die for her. And Abimelech says, What is this thou hast done to us? One of the people might lightly have lain with thy wife, and thou should have brought guiltiness upon us. I wonder, scratch your mind, I wonder where Isaac got that idea. <laughs> huh? You see, here's Abraham speaking unto Isaac. He said, listen, pal, I want you to know something. You know, we're here in this, this land, excuse me, we're here in this land because God called, spoke to me, and I came in faith in God, and God is going to bless us, and God is going to love the land, God is going to do this, and God is going to do that, and he's saying all this as he's headed down into Egypt. See, what you do. And he spoke all these things to, to, to Isaac, his son. He gave all this information to Isaac, his son, but his actions, see, and what impressed Isaac as he goes along, you see, what he did, what he did spoke so loud that he didn't hear what he was saying. You know how we are. We see other, other people do things and they fail and we say, well, <laughs> the reason they fail is, well, they mess up this little piece here. But if I do it, and I take this up, and I change that little piece there, I can make it work. Right? But it doesn't, it doesn't. What we do, you see, and then Isaac does the right thing. It says, then Isaac sowed in the land and received in the land a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Wow. That doesn't make sense, does it? Because Isaac sows in the land in a time of famine. See? First he's failing, he goes somewhere. God says, stay in the land. And all of a sudden the message gets through. He, well, Abraham left the land and he didn't do well in the time of famine. Abraham left the land and it didn't work out right. And God said, stay in the land. So Isaac, even though he had made some mistakes, he made an error. He says, I tell you what, <laughs> I'm going to stick with God and his word. Either God's going to come through and God's word is good or it's not. Now I want you to, to, to picture this. I, I, I question myself what I would do in this circumstance. As I'm going out, the sun is beating down, there's no rain, the ground is totally dry, it's like sand. And I'm going out here and I'm taking my hand to You know how long it takes to plant? Back in those days, he planted in the time of famine. See, that's taken God's word. I'm sure he made mistakes in his life, but he also came to some conclusions that he did what God said, and it says he planted in the time of famine and he received a hundredfold. See, you cannot break God's word. It's impossible for God's word to be broken. And when God says to us, I want you to turn your life over to me and, and give me the, 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 total, the total thing. And we have ideas, you know, we think. I did. I thought. You know how long it took me? 27 years before I... Got it straight. 27 years before. And my mom was the most faithful Christian that you'd ever want to see in your life. She brought me up, and, and I won't go into all that, but I had the best witness 
of what I should do of anybody that's walked the face of the earth. And I did. I made my own choices. I can think. I know what's best. I know how. This is what I want. This is what's going to make me happy. Till the night that I came to life. And I got my life straightened out. Now, the thing that I want us to see about both Abraham and Isaac is this. We see that the bad choices that they made did not determine their final result. Okay? Now, how many people in here are being used for God? How many people in here are going to be used from God? You want to know? I can tell you. I can tell you. Hold up your arm. Everybody hold up your arm. Now take this hand. See, do this. Pinch. See? Can you feel that? If you can feel that, then God's not done with you. Amen. You're still alive. See? These guys face some from some from some bad some bad things from the things that they had done. But it wasn't the final choice. It wasn't the final result. God wasn't done with them. It didn't end there. They changed their mind. They changed their heart. And they, they turned again to do what God wanted them to do. And they received the blessing. And God blessed them. Notice what it said about when Abraham was talk, uh, when God was talking to Isaac. He said, Abraham did what was right. He did this. See, Ab God remembered Abraham for the good that he did and the right that he did. See, that's what it is when God forgives us of our sin. And he washes it away. He just doesn't bury it. It's gone. Like it never happened before. Amen. And God comes along, you see. I, in my own righteousness, there's nothing I can do. Even on the best day that I have. Let's, let's pick the best day of my life. The greatest day that I served God in my life. The greatest thing that I ever did for God. The greatest day that was ever did. I'm not fit to stand in the presence of God. Amen. You see? Why am, I, why am I able then to stand in the presence of God? Because God has given me the gift of His Holy Spirit and He's given me the gift of righteousness. See, righteousness is just a difficult word for the meaning of it is right standing. Right standing. If you are righteous, you're right standing. If you're righteous before God, you are in right standing with God. And God comes down when I turn to Him and He imputes. Remember that word in scripture? Imputes. That's a great word. He imputes his righteousness into me. So that when he looks at me, he no longer sees the person that I am. He sees his righteousness. And because his righteousness is there, I can stand in his place. And that's why he could speak good of Abraham, even though Abraham made some mistakes. And that's why Isaac was able to be successful in the things that he did because he, he didn't quit with his mistakes. The only time the enemy wins is when we make a mistake, we don't get back up. Then he wins. But if we get back up, the way scripture says a righteous man gets back up six, seven times, right? That's just for one thing, you know, six or seven times for the same thing, six or seven times. Righteous man gets back up. When we get back up, we totally defeat everything that Satan tried to do in our life. Amen. See? So that's, that's the way we do. So we can't let ourselves feel bad because we've made mistakes because that's not the end. As I showed you, I'm still alive. I'm still here. I can still make choices. Now, what is God's word to us? We see that their bad choices do not determine their final sight. What about us? What is God's word to us? How are we to live our daily lives? Hebrews 12, 21. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Ye are the light of the world. That's what it says. 
verse 45, Matthew 5, 45. That ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven, and he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. We kind of covered that a little bit this morning. Ephesians 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Children. You know how children are? They just do what they're asked. They have complete faith in you. They just do it. 1 Peter 2.12 Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, people out there, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. See? What we do speaks so loud. They my, they may by your good works, which they shall behold. Philippians 2, 12 through 15. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God, which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke, listen, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. When it says work out your own salvation, what does it mean? It means to fully work, to be fully involved, to be totally committed to this thing. It says that in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, does that ever strike home? Are we in the middle and getting to be even more so in the, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation? It says in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation that you may be blameless and harmless, among whom ye shine as lights. Shine. It means you're seen. You're seen. It doesn't mean that you go down on the corner and put a box and stand on the box and start preaching. Okay? It means that you're seen. <coughs> it's what you do. will speak so loud that they won't be able to deny it. And it will minister to them. We talked about it this morning about the, the nation of, of uh, Rome, the Romans, how they were changed just by what people did. And it says that you shall be light. A light is somebody that this light, what the way it's talked about, is talking about giving off illumination. See, it's like these lights. They're giving off illumination. It is hanging there on the ceiling, doing nothing, but they're giving off light. And because they're giving off light, we can come in and do things. And that's the expression and that's the witness that we are to have in the world. Just giving off what God has given to us. We are to live where we are as we are. Okay? You have a lifestyle. I don't know what it is. I mean, I don't know when you get up and go, go here, go there. You have a week that you do things and, you know, we meet here once a week. But I don't know what you. You don't know what I'm doing during the week. We, we, we're, we're just being there. But God says, if we will fully give ourselves to him and just live, that he will use us and he will cause us to have an impact on other people's lives. So, I think that knowing what God's word says, uh, when it says that we are part of his ordained purpose, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And through all we face and all we live through, one of our commitments, this is what I try to do anyway, 
is that uh, I'm trying to make sure that I can look back with the same satisfaction as those two guys that we talked about at the start. That's part of my goal. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to do it as well as they did. It doesn't make any difference. All right? I'm just a human being, just a hazy from New Hampshire, right? Just living my life day by day. But I can tell you as a testimony, God's word is right. One of the biggest blessings that I have tonight, two of them. I'm a rich man. And if God will do it for me, he'll do it for anybody else. It's just through it all, through all the, the stuff, we have to be fully committed to God. We have to be committed not to go down into Egypt. We have to be committed to stay in the land, land where God has, has put us. And these verses that I've read, we've got to let them inspire us and lead us and guide us through all the issues of life and I'm just telling you that God will do exactly what he says he will do for you in your life amen let's pray Lord I just thank you for this for your word I thank you for the examples that you've put in scripture Lord I just I just thank you that that you just didn't put the good things in but God you uh, through your wisdom and through your strength because you wanted to minister to our hearts you showed that they had weaknesses the same way we do Lord they live life the same way we do they faced issues the same way we do and God you showed us that through it all even though that errors were made misjudgments were made that God you worked in their life and you brought to pass the things that you had ordained for their lives may this speak to our hearts may it challenge us to turn to you more fully and may we just let your Holy Spirit minister and your word guide us in the daily issues of life Lord I just pray this will become true in the name of our Lord Jesus I pray Amen. Amen. Let's pray, sing one more song before we go. It's number 65. It's called The Love of God. Number 65. Here we go. Let's stand. We sing this one. The love of God is greater far beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pay bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. When years of time shall pass away and earthly throne, and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming grace
say one more thing. When we sing this last verse, the words of this last verse, I want you to think of them as we sing them, because you know where these came from. There was a guy who was who was. You know how things happen. He was not designed, but he was committed to be a little bit off up here, and they locked him up in a cell. They locked him up in a cell <coughs> by himself. He was there for years. And when he died, they went into the,、uh, you know, into where he was, into the, into the cell where he was, and they found the words that we're going to sing written on the wall. What number is it? Sixty-five. It's a good thing. Okay, just think. This, as you sing these words, just, just think. This guy's committed to a mental institution, locked away in a cell for years, and this is what he writes. He's inspired the lives of many people. See, what you do, what you do. I'm telling you, folks, you can do it. Every single one of you can do it. <coughs> Here we go. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies a parchment made, where every star on earth a quill?